librarians here. The library coordinates a series every Thursday because we see it as an extension of our charge to promote the freedom of information and open exchange of ideas. So whether or not you wrote everything you hear in the session, or reading books on our shelves, or finding our databases, we want everyone to have access to a wide range of viewpoints so that we can all learn and grow from each other. So, at the end of this, I'll ask you to fill out a very brief survey, asking what you'd like to see in the future, how we did today, to keep this series relevant and interesting for you all. And finally, we have some books up here that are on topic um, of what we're going to be discussing today. And if you'd like to learn more, then you can check one of these out or come talk to me or any of the folks at the reference desk, and they'll be happy to guide you for more research. More research. I know it's something we might be here for class, right? Financial credit or something like that. So, next week, we will have Sean, who will be leading a session on misconceptions in Islam. But today, please join me in welcoming Jay Scott, founder of Live Healthy, Find Hope Project, student, peer counselor, so many times that I can't remember them all, but please join me in welcoming Jay. How's everyone doing? So today we get to learn about heroin in our neighborhood. And so one of the things that I wanted to um, reiterate or, or bring up is that um, this is a multi-dimensional issue. It's not just about the drug, and it's not just about the people. There's a lot of different facets that factor into this problem, which is why it is such a problem, because it seems like our society likes to treat this problem with the symptoms. Um, and it's way more than that. It's not just about the symptoms. It's like a uh, multi-dimensional issue. So my presentation is going to be set up into eight segments. I know it sounds like a lot. There are a few things that I'm not covering, so we can bring them up in discussion, such as um, some of the treatments like methadone and Suboxone. Um, and so how many people in this room has ever been prescribed prescription opiates? Raise your hand. Awesome. Did you guys at ever at any point know that you were highly susceptible to uh, addiction? One, two, three. All right, well, see, that seems like a problem, right? That you could have been like that close, because that's how easy it is to fall into opiate addiction. Uh, so before we go into this presentation, um, I would like to get a group conscience that this is a safe place because this is an extremely confidential or controversial issue. So um, feel free to speak up on it, but um, it's, it's going to be, it's a big topic right now and a lot of people have opinions. Another thing that I wanted to uh, put out there is that there is going to be some pretty graphic uh, content. So I don't know if anyone has an opiate addiction, so if you need to step out, if it's triggering, that's fine. But uh, let's move on into it. So we're going to talk first about how it got started. Um, obviously, um, or not obviously, one of the main reasons why this became such an issue is because of prescription opiates. Doctors were prescribing, way over prescribing these, um, and they didn't have caps on like how many they could prescribe, and uh, people got addicted to it. And then they pulled them because they realized that they were addicted, and heroin was a cheaper alternative. So let's start off with the video. It's a public health epidemic and it is at crisis levels. We still have people who are dying every day. Somebody who overdosed in their car on I-5. Heroin or an opiate overdose kills someone in King County every one and a half days. And the number is rising. Not just for those on the street, but across all socioeconomic backgrounds. It's a public health epidemic and it is at crisis levels. It's hard to grasp the full scope and scale of the opioid crisis we are in the midst of. The numbers are staggering. Almost half a million Americans have died in the last 15 years from an overdose, and the majority of those involve opioids. On average, 91 Americans are still dying every single day. In that same period, the rate of addiction to opioids has shot up by almost 500% and the availability of addiction treatment has not kept up at all. So, how did we get here? Most experts say this crisis began in the 1990s when some doctors and medical associations argued that for generations, their profession had ignored the problem of chronic pain, 
which had caused unnecessary suffering for millions of patients. They started pushing the idea that pain be seen as the fifth vital sign, something to be checked as often as blood pressure and treated accordingly. At roughly the same time, the pharmaceutical industry, which was eager to boost sales of its new class of painkillers like OxyContin, told doctors that these new drugs could be used without fear of their patients becoming addicted. The industry even put out testimonial videos like this one from Purdue Pharma in 2000. We doctors were wrong in thinking that opioids can't be used long term. They can be and they should be. The industry and even some doctors also cited this one paragraph letter posted in the New England Journal of Medicine back in 1980. Its authors had looked at the use of opioid painkillers in one burn unit in Massachusetts and wrote, quote, the development of addiction is rare in medical patients with no history of addiction. While the authors and the New England Journal have both said that this letter was misinterpreted, it was cited hundreds of times as an endorsement for the widespread use of opioids for pain. And in fact, starting in the late 90s and early 2000s, the rate of opioid prescriptions began to snowball. By 2015, according to the CDC, enough pills were being prescribed for every American to be medicated around the clock for three straight weeks. But studies have now clearly shown that opioid medications can lead to dependency within just a matter of days. And so this flood of prescriptions led to a surge of addiction. And it also drove a steady rise in overdose fatalities. With these numbers growing, the medical community, local governments, and law enforcement began to take action. New prescribing guidelines were issued. Databases were created to track prescriptions. This was a pill mill operation. Those are the allegations tonight. And law enforcement began to crack down on the so-called pill mills, the doctors and pharmacies that had been recklessly flooding certain communities with opioids. In 2010, prescriptions of opioids peaked and have fallen ever since. Problem solved, right? Not so fast. In 2015, there were still three times as many opioid prescriptions being written as there were in 1999. And many people have turned to cheaper opioid substitutes like heroin. Seizing on this blue market, drug dealers sought to boost potency and their own profits by lacing their heroin and other drugs with powerful synthetic opioids like fentanyl. Those additives have only accelerated the rise in overdose deaths which last year killed more than 64,000 Americans. By almost any measure, this is the biggest drug epidemic in American history, dwarfing the number of lives lost to crack cocaine or methamphetamines. It's a crisis that took decades to create, and experts say it will take a great deal of time, patience, and work to undo. Awesome. Okay, so this is a picture of Oxygen. This is basically one of the main causes that was way overprescribed, super potent drug, and probably uh, probably responsible for a huge percentage of prescription opioid addiction. Um, so we saw a video, a brief clip of Purdue Pharma's uh, little public service commercial. So here's the full clip of one of them, and um, feel free to laugh. There's no question that our best, strongest pain medicines are the opioids, but these are the same drugs that have a reputation for causing addiction and other terrible things. Now, in fact, the rate of addiction amongst pain patients who are treated by doctors is much less than 1%. They don't wear out, they go on working, they do not have serious medical side effects, and so these drugs, which I repeat, are our best, strongest pain medications, should be used much more than they are for patients in pain. Right, it's not addictive. It'll be all right. Um, so here's the next picture is going to be a picture of a pill mill bust. It's pretty substantial. Um, from what I've heard from people who have started off with prescription um, addiction, opiate addictions, they would go to like um, open houses and then go through people's medicine cabinets, family members, stealing from elderly. It got pretty bad. So, Purdue Pharma is a pharmaceutical company that manufactures OxyContin, this nation's leading prescriber of opiate medication that is responsible for many of the prescription drug problems we have today. In 2007, 
Purdue pled guilty to misleading the public about the addictive qualities of Oxycontin and paid over $600 million, one of the largest pharmaceutical settlements in U.S. history. They still sell opiates and continue to have lawsuits, which leads us to the next slide. Did you guys know that on September 28th in 2017, which is just a few weeks ago, the Attorney General Bob Ferguson sued Purdue Pharma, which made Washington State the latest pharmaceutical, or the latest to hold a pharmaceutical company accountable for opioid addiction. Um, now we're going to move into heroin. It is here. The thing we have dreaded is here. The cloud that has danced off in the distance for so long has crept in during the night, under doors and through cracks. It has seeped into the souls of our children, like a venom violating a bloodstream. It is a mirror to our darkest desires, dirt cheap, plentiful, corrosive, cold-blooded, murderous. Yet it seduces with an irresistible siren song that promises warmth and comfort and numbness. It is the demon at the door, and it is everywhere. On the streets, yes, but also in the suburbs and in the homes, the workplace and the schools. It is where you live, it is who you love. You can't look away any longer, because it is here. The thing we have dreaded is here. Four out of five um, heroin users have previously used painkillers. So the next slide, um, I'm going to ask you guys how this feels after we watch this. So this individual, this story is absolutely heartbreaking. I hope that it touches your heart. And it started by falling out of the back of a, a truck, splitting myself open pretty bad. And they gave me a bunch of pills, and I started taking the pills, and from there it progressed to heroin. The two of them and their friend Lexi walked down an alley next to the Paramount. It is well lit. They don't care. And they start cooking heroin. Six up. Cops roll past. I was uh, splitting shots where they were like making one up for me, one for him. And then this will probably be safer later. Because it's not my this So. They insert the needle and shoot the heroin into their systems. Addicts call it getting well. from 1997 to 2016. 
44% of Americans know someone who is addicted to opiates and has overdosed. So that leads me to my next part. Uh, raise your hand if you know someone who has overdosed and lived uh, from opiates. Overdosed and lived? Overdosed and lived. One, two, three, four. You don't count. I'm just kidding. Uh, raise your hand if you know someone who's overdosed and died from opiates. Do I still don't count? You still count. Um, and raise your hand if you know somebody who uh, is addicted to heroin. It's a pretty substantial amount of us in this room, right? So imagine if I asked the whole school that question. 72% of drug overdoses in King County involve opioids. We're going to move into public health. So this is a multi-dimensional issue. Some of you are probably wondering why I have Starbucks and playgrounds, right? So, if you want, I can pass this around, but this is pretty awful, right? You find these in bathrooms, on the streets, and in playgrounds. Um, who's ever seen a needle on the street? Wow, that's everybody in this room. How'd that make you feel? Sad. Did you ever feel dangerous, like it's dangerous? Yeah. We used to have, we used to have to go to the playground before preschool, when my daughter went to preschool, make sure there was home. So, why this is a multi-dimensional public health issue? Um, we'll move into, uh, no, I'll just wait. Um, one of the things we find a lot here in Seattle is that people use public restrooms that have self-lock services so that they can use them because they don't have other places to use that. Um, what's really sad and one of the things that I've noticed to observe lately is that a lot of people are just using it right out in plain daylight at the bus stop in front of everybody. Um, and there's something really wrong with that. Which brings us to needle exchange services. Um, how many people know what a needle exchange is? Well, that's good. You guys not know what needle exchanges are? Um, needle exchange services. So we have quite a few of them in our community. Um, basically what a needle exchange is, is that people who are using um, can go in and they can usually if they're one for one, where you can take one dirty needle, they'll give you a clean one. Um, they usually have case management and other resources like clean using supplies which uh, I'll talk about a little bit later when we get to my nonprofit. Um, but they also have, usually I've got hep C and HIV testing um, and some other public resources, like they've got condoms and stuff available. They're really good, good resources because we also help prevent finding these things on the street. Um, why should we have the exchange services? Besides what I talked about. To reduce harm and spreading of disease, so you can use it safely. And what what does that prevent? The spread of Hep C, HIV, HIV. Awesome. So the next question is: I don't use drugs. Why should my taxpayer dollars go into needle exchange programs? Anybody else? People in our society suffer, our whole society suffers as a whole because it's, that's just the way it works. Only 1% gets better than the benefit of the whole society. So, I have two kids. I have an 8-year-old and I have a 6-year-old. And uh, so we were at the emergency room. And I don't remember why, but we were over at Harborview. And we're walking down James. And I'm not paying attention. It's in the middle of summer. I should have been paying attention. And I stop, and I'm like, stop, freeze. And my kids stop. What the fuck, you know? Um, they're wearing flip flops, right? So I'm going to zoom in on this. We've got one, two, three, and four, and they're both open, open cap. This is why we need needle exchange services, and this is also why we need safe place consumption sites. But also, don't those places, like if, if the, you know, um, the addict 
goes into an overdose, there's people there to help them too as well. Yes. Doesn't it provide that services too? Correct. So for those of you who don't know, uh, in Vancouver, BC, they have the, one of their safe place consumption sites, which we've been modeling is uh, what we want ours to look like here in Seattle. Um, it's called Insight, and ever since they've opened, and I don't remember when they opened, but it's been it's been quite a few years that they've been open. They've had no overdose deaths. So this is Hep C. Did you guys know Hep C can live outside the body for up to three weeks? Which means if we accidentally stuck ourselves with one of these, or um, that you could potentially be vulnerable for that. So as far as some of my literature that you guys can grab over here, um, I've got information on the Hep C Education Project, which is over there off Jackson. They're super awesome people. Um, whether you use drugs or not, which I'm assuming people in this room don't, but they offer free Hep A and Hep B shot vaccines, and they're free, and I mean, those are very expensive. Um, they also just opened up a needle exchange um, a couple months ago. It's on Thursdays from 1 to 5. Um, my nonprofit is working on collaborating with them. They're really awesome people. Um, we've got them. They're going to start going out with us once we get our tent set up uh, next month for the winter months. And they're going to do on-site Hep C rapid testing for the people that we're working with, which is super awesome. So grab some of the literature on that table when we are done. So here's a chart that shows uh, syringe exchanged in King County from 1989 to 2006, provided by the Washington Department of Health. As you can see, we've progressively moved way, way, way up. Um, and this is awesome, why? It's reduced the amount of uh, cases of HIV. Did you know more than 4,000 Americans get uh, HIV from unsafe drug use? A lot of people think that it's from sex. It's actually from IV drug use. Um, which will bring me to my next chart, which is also provided by the Washington Department of Health. So some of you are probably wondering why I don't have the other ones highlighted. Because yes, these are other forms of transmission of HIV, but one of those we want to pay attention to is the IV drug use, which is what IDV stands for. We're not single, singling out men who have sex with men, but uh, we're more focusing on the ID, IDU, which is IV drug use. We can see that from 2008 to 2009, you see the numbers slowly decrease, which the exchange services. So another handout is this is the most updated version of the King County needle exchanges. Uh, obviously, we're not on there, but um, I have these handouts if you guys want to take out and hand to people. Um, this is good to know, not necessarily if you um, need to do exchanges, but uh, they also is the places that um, you can take in dirty needles. If you find them in your backyard and you feel safe enough to pick them up, take them in, they'll be the places that will take them off your hands without charging. You can take them to like Bartels, but uh, they're going to charge you $2. So, uh, me and Village Healthy Fine Hook Project worked with Robert Smiley uh, a couple months ago. We went up to this site in Everett. So it was 155 yards of trash that they pulled off this plot of land that was occupied by people experiencing homelessness and IV drug use. Um, and uh, we extracted all of that. So from 155 yards of, of trash, they pulled out this many um, I, uh, needles off the, off the ground. This was right outside of a retirement home. Uh, and we're going to move into diversion programs. Does anybody know what a diversion program is? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Instead of uh, putting somebody in jail, they are uh, the cops we put them in touch with the counselor who lets them, you know, build up their life and you know, get away from the patient. Right. So diversion programs. Um, instead of bagging, I'll call it bagging and tagging. We can't arrest our way out of this problem. We can't put everybody in jail. Uh, IV drug use or drug use in general is usually a victimless crime. Back to the multidimensional part of this issue is that um, if we look at people who are experiencing <coughs> homelessness and using um, or are suffering from uh, addiction, um, yet yeah, we have it's going to raise our levels of theft and um, 
property damage because they need to support their habit. Um, so usually, like I mean, they're gonna get in trouble for those acts. Um, generally here in Seattle, which we're gonna find out in a second, we have a program called LEAD, uh, which is Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. Um, basically what this is, is for people who are picked up with multiple drug offenses, uh, which we have one of our clients who got into LEAD. Um, instead of putting them in jail and charging them with like felonies, which will ultimately take away your opportunities later on if you do get to get clean, uh, we put them in, we can get them into di diversion programs. So I'm gonna talk about legal diversion programs, but there's other diversion programs such as like, um, if people are experiencing uh, dual diagnosis, which is substance use and mental health issues, we have programs like the Crisis Solution Center, uh, where they try to address wraparound services, so it's not just um, their drug services, but instead of putting them in jail, we're gonna get them some mental health issues, get them medicated, and try to get them discharged, hopefully in maybe some like halfway houses, or um, other programs that help all the way around. The LEAD program is funded by a grant, but if you're a taxpayer, you'll find this math more than compelling. One-tenth of our prison population is there on drug charges, many repeat offenders. That's $60,000 a year to house each inmate. Add in the initial costs of arrests and prosecutions, and the expense per offender is staggering. One of the unique features of LEAD is that we have a partnership between the ACLU and the Defender Association, uh, the Seattle Police, and the King County Prosecutor's Office. They work. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this is a statistic that just came out about a month or two ago. Um, in the Vietnam War, it came out in 2006, in the Vietnam War, 5,900, no, I can't, I can't read it. Thank you. Essentially, the overhead dose deaths in 2016 surpassed the entire death count of the Vietnam War. It's pretty substantial. Um, this is right up your alley. So, one of the problems that we have, which is, is this is a wraparound problem, right? It's multidimensional, is that we've got people who are overdosing, people who have abscess, people who need other medical services, and they don't have any money, which means that we're paying for it, for them to do this repetitive revolving door. Um, abscess, they go to emergency rooms. In 2001, we paid $27 billion overall in other heroin-related um, hidden heroin costs. So this is 2001 over 2017. That number is probably triple, triple at least. In Seattle alone, for example, deaths from heroin overdoses rose by 58% over the course of 2014, from 99 to 156. Seattle's proposed heroin safe zone would be a safe consumption site that's different from a methadone clinic. Seattle already has some of those. At this safe zone, heroin addicts would use drugs under medical supervision, hopefully lowering rates of fatal overdose and also preventing transmission of diseases from dirty needles. They would also have opportunities to receive addiction treatment. The idea of a safe consumption site isn't brand new, and it wouldn't make heroin legal. The Heroin Task Force, formed by Mayor Ed Murray and King County Executive Dow Constantine, is calling for a radical rethink of how the city interacts with heroin addicts, many of whom are also homeless. Murray, by the way, is further proposing an improved homeless shelter to welcome the addicts off the streets. Of course, this is a pretty controversial idea. Opponents have some valid questions, perhaps the most obvious being, A, isn't giving people a place to do drugs as well as the equipment to do it, essentially enabling their addiction? Fortunately, this does not seem to be the case. There's fairly compelling evidence that creating safe consumption sites can have tangible benefits. Take Vancouver, for instance. It's home to a 13-year-old safe injection area called Insight, where no overdose deaths have occurred. Insight has been the subject of multiple peer-reviewed studies indicating that the site has saved lives, reduced disease transmission, and brought more addicts into treatment programs. 
programs. The goal of these enterprises is to keep addicts alive long enough to enter treatment while also reducing the social impact addicts can have on the surrounding community, such as leaving dirty needles in alleyways and public parks. Seattle hasn't officially signed off on creating this sort of site yet, and there are some difficult questions to tackle before anything like this actually opens. In a country where citizens spend billions of dollars buying drugs and governments spend billions of dollars attempting to squash the trade, is it time to reassess how all of that money could be spent? Or is something like this just enabling people, as opponents suggest, and accelerating the very epidemic it was designed to stop? So, this is a picture of a booth in Insight. Honestly, before I knew about safe place consumption sites and I just heard they were going to open a place for people to use IV drugs, I, I honestly, I pictured probably what most everyone pictured is a drug house with a bunch of people using drugs and it's sanctioned. That's what I thought. This is actually what it looks like. It's a medical looking clinic. Um, there's booths that are open. They provide all of the medical supplies, which helps safe use and prevention of transmitting HIV, Hep C, and other IV related health problems. And they've got medical staff that if there is overdoses, they can help assist in that. So for those of you who don't know, um, I think it was over the summer, um, they, a whole bunch of people signed a petition to ban uh, safe place consumption sites on the ballot. Um, actually, on uh, October 16th, a King County judge ruled that um, citizens um, don't have the opportunity to um, vote on public health issues. So I'm going to put that in, um, I'm going to use a different example, but make that make sense. Is, let's say we got a whole bunch of people that, together to say we don't want flu shots, so we're going to sign a petition to prevent people from getting flu shots. It's a public health issue. It's outside of our, our bounds to be able to touch. I think this is super awesome. Um, here's a picture of me with my little sign that says, uh, I support safe business consumption sites. So let's save a life. Uh, we're going to move into uh, naloxone. Who knows what naloxone is besides you three? Kimberly. <laughs> really. uh, tell me if I'm misremembering. Naloxone is what you the drug that you, in, or what you inject when someone is having an overdose that will bring them out of it sometimes angrily. Yes, yes. definitely bring them out angrily. That's a nice, nice one. So, cool thing about you guys here, and there's actually a good amount of people that you guys would be good at, is I brought naloxone kits for everyone to take. I hope there's enough people. Super awesome, carry it around with you. Um, these are pretty expensive. The specific one is about $65 each. You're going home. It's like the Ellen show, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, there are three different types of naloxone right now. We have this nasal spray, which um, I didn't have the training video in here before, but when I decided I was going to give everybody one, I felt obligated to have you guys learn how to use it. So, it's going to be a little bit of a long video, but you'll be all right. Um, there is the IV. IV ones, you drop the full contents of the one milliliter vial. Sometimes you'll find it in threes or fives. Um, and it'll go it get injected into fatty tissues, arm, butt, thighs. Um, these ones I try to give to my clients who are actually in active addiction. It's really hard to give these to good Samaritans because most people feel uncomfortable with sticking other people with needles when they don't use needles. Um, and finally, there's another nasal spray that you can get at King County Public Health. And you have to put all these little pieces together. Um, it's got like an atomizer. And has the nasal spray been found to be really effective? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. A lot of people have this theory that uh, the nasal spray is not as effective as the injectable ones. It's injectable and it's straight into your body. Um, and if they're not breathing, how are they going to use the nasal spray? Well, it's because it's actually getting absorbed by the, mucus, the membranes in your nose. It doesn't really matter. Do um, you want to say something? No, it, it totally works. It takes about three to five minutes, and then you come out of it. Um, a lot of people ask, well, is it safe to use? Um, it can be used on pregnant women and children, and it will not hurt you unless you're, like, it won't hurt you at all. But it only works if you're experiencing an opiate overdose. It's an antidote. So if you're not experiencing overdose, it's not going to do anything. 
It won't hurt you. Overdose drug called naloxone. Through uh, King County, we put out uh, over 1,500 Narcan kits. We know from what we're tracking that at least 19 reported overdoses have, um, there's been a successful use of Narcan to bring somebody back to life. The Metro Police are carrying them, Seattle PD is carrying them, many of our suburban cities, their police force is carrying them, EMTs countywide are now carrying. So, naloxone is a temporary antidote for opioid overdose. It can be found in injectable forms. These are all the things that I've told you. Um, it's not illegal to carry. There's speculation like, well, oh, are you going to get in trouble if you find it? If the police find it on you, um, you won't get in trouble. It's not illegal to carry. And you can get it over the counter at drug stores, and it's expensive. But I'm going to give you one for free. So how does it work? So when someone's going into an overdose, uh, the opiates block the opiate receptors in the brain, which causes you to stop breathing. Um, naloxone will temporarily knock off the opiates from the opiate receptors, allowing you to temporarily breathe again. Um, one of the most important things to reiterate in this scenario is that uh, the naloxone should come into effect between about five minutes. It will also wear off after 30 minutes. So if someone's um, overdosing significantly and you don't get that medical attention, they will go back into overdose. Um, and one of the things that we talked about earlier is when you're using it on somebody, they will come back and they're going to be pissed, and they can come back uh, pretty combative. Um, I actually used naloxone to save a guy's life up in Highway Freeway Park. Um, I just happened to be walking through, so he got super lucky. He was with a friend who came out screaming hysterically, and I just happened to have my kid on me. When I give him to you, you should try to carry him with you all the time. You never know. Um, Signs of an opioid overdose, trouble walking, trouble talking, won't wake up, difficulty breathing and gurgling sounds, uh, cold, clammy, gray and purple uh, lips and nails, and pinpoint pupils. Um, I think that in a lot of some saves lives, and should be as readily available as EpiPens. Like I said, it can wear off about for about 30 minutes. Uh, if you ever see anyone, call 911. I recommend you call, or go ahead. I just wanted to ask if there's like you know, any you know, consent you know, like that you can give somebody who you know is overdosing and you know um, if it's okay to do it because they might not be overdosing but you know have all these symptoms and you know. That's a good question. So we're going to watch a video that shows the signs. One of the things I do is to keep safe is you do the uh, sternum rub. They don't respond. The blue and clammy nails is always a good one and it's not going to hurt them. You know what I mean? So. Safe and sorry. That's what I was going to say, is that it won't cause them any harm if they're not overdosing. Um, another thing is, like, in my opinion, generally, you can tell if they've been using opiates. Like, uh, like if you find someone drunk and passed out, there's going to be different signs. Most other drugs, people don't really know this, but you can't really overdose off the of methamphetamines. Um, you, can't, you can't overdose. Like, you can have heart complications from crack cocaine. Um, but, like, an opiate overdose is totally different. Um, this is me doing the Loxon training. Good Samaritan law is super important. So there's going to be, I think there is, um, hands out. So I'm giving you guys naloxone kits. You guys should all take these handouts that are going to be printed out. Um, Good Samaritan law prevents you from any legal repercussions in the event, in the, uh, event of acting in a good faith of a medical emergency. Um, you can look up this information on stopoverdose.org, which is specifically for Washington State. Um, and like I said, there are these three handouts um, that'll be up front, and you should all grab them. But also with this law, though, if you see somebody that's in need and you go over there to help them, and, and you leave before the proper medical people get there, you can get in trouble for that. So if you go over to help somebody, you have to stay with them until medical somebody's arrived. Don't leave them to die. So you should know that. And it also doesn't cover if they have warrants, if they have warrants, they can be arrested. Correct. Let's see how that's. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. 
As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. Please see indications and important safety information at the end of this video. Also, please see accompanying full prescribing information in the use of this product. Narcan nasal spray is an emergency treatment for a known or suspected opioid overdose. The appropriate use of Narcan nasal spray can help you save a life. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. As with any drug, you need to be aware of important safety information concerning its use. If you encounter someone who is unresponsive and you suspect an overdose, first shake their shoulders and shout their name. Kevin. Ask if he or she is okay. Hey, can you hear me? Check for signs of an overdose, unresponsive to touch or voice. Breathing is slow, uneven, or has stopped. <sighs> Snoring, gasping, or gurgling sounds. Fingernails or lips are blue or purple. Administer Narcan nasal spray as quickly as possible if someone is unresponsive and an opioid overdose is suspected, even when in doubt, because prolonged respiratory depression may result in damage to the central nervous system or even death. Lay the person on their back to receive a dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove Narcan nasal spray from the box. Peel back the tab with a circle to open it. Remove and review the printed quick start guide inside the package. Hold the Narcan nasal spray with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and your first and middle fingers on either side of the nozzle. Do not press the plunger to test or prime the device. If you do, you will waste all or part of the dose of medication. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under the neck with your hand. Gently insert the tip of the nozzle into one nostril until your fingers on either side of the nozzle are against the person's nose. Press the plunger firmly to give the full dose of Narcan nasal spray. Remove the device from the nostril after giving the dose. After you have given this medication, seek emergency help right away. Narcan nasal spray is not a substitute for emergency medical care. I'm with somebody who stopped breathing. I think they've had an overdose. Move the person on their side after giving Narcan nasal spray. If possible, put their hands under their head and bend their upper leg forward. This helps prevent the person from rolling onto their stomach. This is known as the recovery position. Continue to watch the person closely. If they do not wake up or respond to your voice or touch, or if they do not seem to be breathing normally within two to three minutes, use a new Narcan nasal spray to give an additional dose in the other nostril. Acute opiate withdrawal symptoms may occur from use of Narcan nasal spray in patients who are opioid dependent. Symptoms include body aches, diarrhea, increased heart rate or tachycardia, fever, runny nose, sneezing, goosebumps, also known as pyloerection, sweating, yawning, nausea or vomiting, nervousness, restlessness or irritability, shivering or trembling, abdominal cramps, weakness and increased blood pressure. When the emergency is over, put the Narcan nasal spray back in its box and throw it away in a place that is away from the reach of children. In addition to watching this video, please read the quick start guide that comes with Narcan nasal spray before using it. Talk to a healthcare professional if you have any questions about how to administer Narcan nasal spray. Please read the indications and important safety information that follows. Store Narcan nasal spray at room temperature between 59 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit, 15 to 25 degrees centigrade. Do not freeze Narcan nasal spray. Keep Narcan nasal spray in the box until ready to use. Protect from light. Replace Narcan nasal spray before the expiration date on the box. Keep Narcan nasal spray and all medicines out of the reach of children. Yay, who's excited to take one home? Woo That's a, a mess, a mess. All right, cool. So. If you have any more questions after this, ask me, um, and we can talk about it, and there's plenty of literature here on how to use it. Um, so I worked really hard on this segment, and it turned out pretty good. Um, so obviously I'm pretty involved in the community, so I took the opportunity to reach out to my friends in the community, and I brought them with me. And so they're gonna talk to you about their personal perspectives. And so uh, when we get to Patricia Sully, she's super, really busy. So she sent me this video instead, because um, I tried to get her to do one, and she just didn't help. This here is Central. My name is Joe Connors. I'm a resource case manager with King County Drug Diversion Corp, as well as a business owner. Uh, I co-own King
Kale love kale chips, and I'm also an addict in recovery from heroin. Uh, I've been clean for about 29 months now. I want to talk to you briefly about the heroin epidemic here in Washington State in particular, and um, just shed some light on the, the idea that I think most of us um, at this point understand that addiction knows no demographics and does not discriminate against any particular groups of people. It's uh, very all-inclusive, um, unfortunately. And so I just wanted to uh, bring to light some of the things that worked for me to get into recovery and maybe some things that we can use in our dealings with other folks in the community that are battling substance use disorder. Um, primarily the things that were available to me were the therapeutic court model, like a drug diversion court, which I'm a graduate of, um, social support services, um, medical coverage, um, as well as the support of my family, friends, and uh, peers. And so I think one of the, the key ingredients too is, is for those of us that are engaging individuals in active addiction is that we, we meet them with a, a lens of compassion and understanding as much as possible. And that those of us that are, that are in recovery can carry a message of hope um, and shed some light that recovery is possible for, for everybody. Um, thank you for your time. Hi, Seattle Central. My name is Marlis McCall, and this is my son, Andrew. Andrew passed away of an accidental heroin overdose January 6, 2015. He was just 27 years old. Andrew was raised on the east side in Newcastle. We had a nice home, and I was lucky enough to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, he was diagnosed with ADD at the age of six and struggled for most of his life with anxiety and depression somewhere along the way also began struggling with the evils of heroin. His last attempt at treatment was in 2014, and in December of that same year, he left a job that he was very proud of, um, came home, attempted to detox on his own, um, was able to spend one last Christmas with his family, and then lost his life to an accidental overdose that followed in January. Andrew wanted to live. He had plans and hopes and dreams for the future like you and I. Please know that opioid use disorder does not discriminate. Please continue learning about it. Learn about harm reduction. Learn about safe consumption spaces. Um, talk about it. Talk openly without judgment to those that are struggling. We have got to break the shame and stigma that surrounds heroin addiction. I'm convinced that it played a part in my son's death and it's not okay. We need to let those that are suffering know that they matter, that they are loved, and that there is hope for recovery. Thank you. I love her. Um, so it's 12.50, um, so that's technically the end of the session, so if you have to go to class, do that, um, and I'll keep going. Seattle's been really intentional about talking about supervised consumption spaces instead of supervised injection. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is racial disparity. We know that crack cocaine enforcement really fueled a lot of the racial disparity that we see in King County. And crack cocaine is a drug that's primarily smoked. When we think about the implications of a space in which people can inject drugs but not smoke drugs, it really leads to the question, who's left out? And if we leave out people who smoke drugs, those are the people who are open and vulnerable to law enforcement, and the people who inject drugs are not. And we don't want to set up more disparity. We, in fact, want to treat all drug users with equity and dignity and respect. So it's really important that spaces be inclusive. And then the other reason really comes from a public health approach of we know that injecting drugs is the most dangerous way to consume. If and when someone says, hey, I'd like to move from injecting to smoking, the answer to that needs not be, great, go back out to the alley. We want to keep people in the continuum of care, keep them connected to the relationships that they develop in that space. We don't want to kick anybody out. We want to bring people in. And the best way to do that is to not limit ourselves. Let's have drug consumption, not just supervised injection. Hi, I'm Ray Dillon. I'm the HIV Hep C Outreach Specialist and Addiction Counselor at Seattle Counseling Service. Also, I'm an alumni of Seattle Central. Working out in the field, doing my outreach work, I see firsthand the ravages that the heroin addiction is bringing upon the city, not only Seattle, but many cities. I'm a firm believer in 
the safe injection sites and look forward to Seattle finally being able to get those in place. A takeaway, uh, I think the segment of the population that utilizes heroin is among the most difficult to reach and provide services for. And so anything that will help that, such as the safe injection sites, I am all for. Thank you. My name is Kevin Nooney, and I'm a peer support specialist for Project Peer, an HIV prevention and prep program from Seattle Counseling Service. Project Peer is a brand new peer-run program funded by the Department of Health. We work one-on-one -on -one with those people at high risk for contracting HIV to try and help prevent new transmissions. Project Peer is focused on providing education about safe sex practices, distributing safe sex supplies, and providing assistance for those who want to get on PrEP. PrEP stands for Pre-Exposure Prophylaxis, meaning that it provides protection against infection. Project Peer works hard to reach out to the community in order to spread the word about our services and about PrEP. Now, I consider my personal history to be a huge asset to me in my outreach work. I started using opiates when I was 15, and I'm now 31 and have just about three years sober. While I was using actively, I was also selling drugs to support myself, and this brought me into contact with a very wide variety of people and gave me a lot of insight into how addiction manifests differently from person to person. Traditionally, the societal response to addiction has been won by the criminal justice system. As was proved by alcohol prohibition, these tactics are ineffective, costly, and overall damaging to society at large, creating an atmosphere that includes widespread contempt for the law and a conducive environment for additional crime. The most efficient and effective tactics to address these issues are based around the principles of harm reduction, and I truly feel that this is the way to move forward in coping with the problems of addiction in our society today. Thanks for listening. Hi, Seattle Central. My name is Shelley Todd, and I'm a peer outreach specialist and recovery coach for the Live Healthy Find Hope Project. We're a small group of volunteers who goes out every Friday night, and we meet people where they're out on the streets. We do a needle exchange and harm reduction, which I'm very passionate about. I also support safe consumption sites. It gives us an opportunity to save lives and to give them a little bit of hope. If they have the connections, sometimes they will go to treatment right away. If we give them a little bit of hope, we treat them like human beings. It could be, they're all somebody's brother, sister, mother. Um, the people that I've met on the street have been amazing. And it humbles me to be out there because these people are very sick. And if we give them hope and attention and we go out there and we shake their hands and we touch them. A lot of them are, you know, living in tents and have no human contact. Um, I recently ran into someone who, she hadn't had a shower in three months and just to stand in her shower was amazing to her. It's just the little things in life. So I'm very supportive of whatever goes on to help the heroin addicts that are on the streets because people are dying and it's become an epidemic and if I can do one thing, just get a dirty needle off the street, hand out some Narcan and give clean needles to somebody who's desperate, it's all worth it to me. Thank you. So, uh, how can you get involved? Uh, raise awareness, naloxone, always good to carry. Uh, volunteer, there's many opportunities to volunteer. You have exchanges, um, volunteer for us. I have a volunteer uh, sign up sheet where you can put your name and email if you're interested. I'm gonna pass that around now because um, we're getting over time. Um, vote and speak out. Food for thought. Remember that uh, this is, bagging and tagging isn't gonna work. Uh, we can't arrest our way out of this problem. Most importantly, remember that these people are experiencing homelessness and suffering from addiction, uh, substance use disorder, are human beings just like you and me. They deserve basic human needs and they sadly are not being met. 
Uh, if you encounter people in the public, if nothing else, just say hello, I see you, and acknowledge that they exist. A small conversation can mean the world to them. Human beings are social creatures, and we are pushed, when we are pushed out of society and placed into harsh conditions, we have become barrel. The lack of will to live starts to diminish and hope slips away. The Healthy Find Out Project. So Shelly and Marlene are over here, and after we're done with this, we'll step out and answer any questions you guys have about our outreach and what we do. Here's a couple pictures of, uh, a couple slides of pictures of our volunteers um, out in the field. We just got a grant from the Department of Health of the state of Washington for $1,000 for medical supplies. And founding members at Seattle Central, Shelly Todd and Eric Coutinho, we are in the Social Human Services Program. If you're here and you're in the school, you should volunteer too. Um, if you're interested, just let us know, sign up. Um, so this is important. When you leave today, up front, this is the information for the Washington Recovery Helpline. Uh, whether you need it or not, it's always cool to hand out to somebody else. Uh, if you have Facebook, take a chance to uh, like us on Facebook. We're a happy bunch. And then, uh, questions is answers. That's all I got. Yay. <laughs> for an incredibly relevant, timely, and informative presentation. So the, the handouts that Jay mentioned are up here. Feel free to grab some and candy. They're also wristbands. Um, and Jay is handing out the microphone right now. So you can get one. Hey, same couple for me. And I'm going to ask us to be a little bit swift in our moving since there's a class that's going to be in here in a few minutes. Yes. Okay. And you can hand the surveys back to me. Can I give you another one later? Yes. Okay.